Hello everybody. Do I look different now? I, I recorded a, a whole series of videos uh, months ago and uh, that's what I've been putting out so far. Now uh, I have to do more recording again so um, we're going to continue with this uh, same rabbi. He he, he put out a two-hour video and I'm answering it piece by piece because some of the uh, topics he touches on are quite deep topics and uh, I want to make sure that we don't uh, skip things and that we answer almost everything uh, in some clear way and some of it might seem redundant but we're kind of building a a bit of a foundation here because it, it's going to get quite involved and quite deep into the scriptures so we want to uh, try to keep uh, you know some air and and try to keep things as simple as possible and without going too far off onto some wild goose chase so uh, in this segment, the Rabbi Skolbik, um, his main point that he's making now is that when God in the Old Testament, when he talks about God and the Messiah, that they are two different people. And therefore, Jesus cannot be the Messiah and be God at the same time. So we're going to address this issue. Um, now, I've mentioned this uh, scriptures before, but uh, this is a good time to readdress it for people who haven't watched the other videos. Um, if we look at in Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse 5, uh, that Paul the Apostle was speaking about the uh, different natures of Jesus before, during, and after the time he walked on earth. So, <clears throat> look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things on the earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So now this is an age-old um, theological debate on is Jesus God? Is Jesus equal to God? Is Jesus under God? Um, and uh, it's still a debatable thing. It's like if you think about a prophet, the prophet is speaking, right? Why should we listen to the prophet? The prophet's not God. He's not God. But then he's speaking the words of God. And even when he's not directly speaking the words of God, is only those words what we should listen to? Or is it the entire book that the prophet wrote? Because sometimes the prophet is telling a story about himself and then God comes to him and gives those words, his own God's words. So, you know, is the prophet's 
the Word of God? Is the whole book the Word of God? Or is it just the parts in the book where God is actually speaking? Uh, why, how would this prophet be God? You know, it's, it's the same kind of argument. It's like, it is the Word of God because the, the book is giving a context to, and then the actual words of God are within that context. And so the whole thing lays out a landscape that deepens your understanding of God. So where does, you know, the question, where does the prophet end and where does God begin? You know, it's, uh, it's the same kind of question. And um, if you look at uh, some of the uh, apocryphal Jewish writings, like uh, the Book of Enoch or uh, the Book of Jubilees, I think, touches on it, the Book of Barak, um, where there's this Son of Man that is with God and that is like residing with God and, and it's this mysterious person that is like he's so close to God that he's almost part of God and, it, and it's hard to discern who this person is and, and, and uh, it's the same as uh, some of the readings we did in the last video about Abraham having dinner with God God walking in the garden, talking with Adam and Eve. Um, you know, uh, Jacob wrestling with God and being named Israel. So it's the same question, like, is that God or is that something, someone that came from God or is that an angel or, you know, how, where does this person walking in the garden end? And where does God begin? It's the same question. And the answer is that God is in all things and all things are in God. Um, is God able to uh, uh, occupy a human body and be a person walking among us? Um, absolutely, yeah, he's able to do that. Why wouldn't he be able to do that? Um, now, when you start looking at God's Word, and it starts to distinguish between God, the eternal spirit that cre created and inhabits everything and even beyond everything, you distinguish that between God, the person that is in the human body, having dinner with Abraham. So when it starts to distinguish between those two things, it's not two different people. It's the same God in two different uh, aspects of what he is doing. And now he has the same mind as God, and, and, and they're so interconnected that you cannot tell them apart, but then it's God in two different situations at the same time that you can tell them apart, but it's the same God, if that makes any sense. So it's, it's one of these, you know, eternal mysteries of God that, yes, he can be in two places at the same time, and it's the same God. So that's, uh, that's the... Um, the theological debate that never ends. So Jesus was with God, then he became born as a man. Now born as a man, Paul almost says he's separate from God, but he cannot be separate from God because he came from God. And so as a man, he overcame the flesh and subjected the flesh to God because he cannot be separate from God. And this is sort of the, the, the mystery of the nature of Jesus. That, and then he brought the flesh into obedience even to death. And he did 
he often said, I only speak the things that God tells me to speak. I don't speak my own words. So what are his own words if they're different from what God would say? Is I think he's talking about the flesh and the mind of the flesh want to say something, but I don't let them say anything. I only say what the things of God say. So the things of the spirit of life that is in the flesh. And there that's where there's a separation there. So that if you take a man, okay, where does the man end and, and the spirit of life begin? It's the same kind of question again, is they're they're intertwined, but there is a difference and there's also a similarity. So um you start trying to split those kind of hairs, you're going to run into problems all the time. So, you know, just to try to have that understanding of the three natures of Christ is makes helps you makes more sense of prophecy. Is that when Jesus was before he was born, he was with God. What that exactly means is up to you. He was with God. Not only with God, but even with God on the throne of God, above the angels, with God. If you look at the book of Enoch, you'll see it that way. And then, uh, um, then he became a man, and he was with men, and one of us. But he was still completely connected to God. And, and in a way separate from God, but not separate from God. Um, his spirit was united to God. And um, then he became obedient even unto death. And then he, his body died. And God raised him from the dead. And in body... He raised up, he was in the body, he was speaking, eating, talking with the disciples, but also able to appear and disappear in a room. Uh, but he was a, he also had this physical body that they recognized him and to talk to him. And then in bodily in bodily form, he went up to heaven, was carried up into heaven. And that's and he said he will return. So this is the God in bodily form. This this is the the God in the flesh is how the Christian scriptures describe him. He is God in the flesh. Now there is a God that is not in the flesh, the eternal God. But the God in the flesh is that same God in the flesh. As if he's the same guy that walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. The same guy that wrestled with Jacob and ate with Abraham. It's that guy. Okay? So that's how Christians understand Jesus. It's not a separate God, a separate thing. Or it's not another God. It's another form of God. Okay, and, and that's uh, basically what the Trinity is. It's three different aspects that God is able to come to us as. Or that we, uh, if we look at all three of those things at the same time, then we have a greater understanding of who and what God actually is. So, um, now, we'll take a look at some scriptures um, after we listen to the rabbi talk a little bit here. And then we'll answer some of the scriptures he says. And we'll look at some others too, to, to sort of surrounding this topic. Isaiah chapter 11, listen carefully. Listen very carefully. According to every person on the planet, 
every Jew and every Christian, this chapter in Isaiah 11 describes the Messiah. And listen to what it says. A shoot will come out from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. And the Spirit of God will rest upon him, a spirit of counsel and strength, a spirit of knowledge and the fear of God. And he will be imbued with a spirit of fear for God. Isaiah here is telling us the Messiah will be someone who fears God. If the Messiah was supposed to be God, what would Isaiah should have said? And he will be God. And you will fear him. Isaiah says twice, the Messiah will be someone who fears God. What do you see from that? He is not God. He is someone who fears God. And the, in the Jewish Bible, you always see God distinguished from the Messiah. For example, Hosea chapter 3, afterward the children of Israel will return and seek out Hashem their God and David their king. That's the Messiah. So it's not the same being. It's, the, it's God and the Messiah. They're separate. They're not the same being. Jeremiah chapter 30. But they will serve Hashem their God and David their king who I'll raise up for them. God says, I am going to raise up David the Messiah. Me, God, will raise up the Messiah. He's not saying the Messiah is God. God is going to raise up the Messiah. Okay, so we listen to the rabbi and... Um, now, before we go ahead and uh, look at the verses that he talked about, first let's take a quick look at um, some of the things I was talking about earlier. And we will look at the Tanakh and see if we can not find these concepts in the Tanakh. Okay, so we're going to look, look at the whole chapter 8 in First Samuel. And it came to pass once, now, okay, who was Samuel? He was long before King David. Um, Samuel was a uh, prophet that was raised up in the, during the time of the judges of Israel. And Samuel was raised up as a high priest. He became a high priest and he also became a judge of Israel. He was the, the priest and ruler at that time of the, before Israel was split into two kingdoms. So it was the entire nation of Israel. Okay. And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel and the name of his second, Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba, and his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. So his sons were not good leaders. <clears throat> then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old. And thy sons not walk in the in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say to thee, for they have not rejected thee but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. You see, God was their king. God was ruling over them. And now God is saying, they are rejecting me in asking for a king. Okay? Now, what I'm getting at here is, we're, we're, think, think ahead. The Messiah is the king. Okay? So now let's look at like where this king idea started. Okay. So they rejected God by asking for a king. According, okay, carrying on in verse 8, 
according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, and so they also do this unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly to them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked him of a king. And he said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and, and to be his housemen. And some shall run before his chariots, and he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties, and he will set them to, to ear his ground and to reap his harvest. I guess that means to plant corn, to ear his ground. And to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. And he will take a tenth of your sheep and you shall be his servants. And you shall cry out in that day because of your king, which you shall have chosen you. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. Okay? So that's a very important verse right there. Because you will have a king, and he will do all these things to you, and the Lord will not hear you. Because he's not your king anymore. You have a new king. You go talk to your king. Don't talk to the Lord. Okay, so this is what he's getting at, okay? So, nonetheless, the people refused to ob obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, no, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he reversed and, and Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord, as if he didn't know already. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto their voice, and make them a king. And Samuel said to the men of Israel, Go you every man to his city. And then it goes on where he made Saul the king. And uh, then after that, then it became David. Uh, David replaced Saul as the king. And David is the good king that God said, I will raise up a son after you, and his kingdom shall last forever. So, um, so there's a bad king and then the good king. So this is a, sort of the, uh, the bad king. God will not hear them. God is showing them what a man, king, will do for them, which is nothing, nothing good. It's kind of like today, right? And then there's the good king, David, who is guided by God. And that God said, this is the acceptable thing that will, will take a king that is after my own heart that will rule over the people. Okay? So... The idea of the Messiah is a king that is completely for God. That, that will rule as God would rule. As if he was God. He's so in tune with God. Where does the king end and where does God begin? Because if you remember, God is this eternal being 
who lives even beyond eternity, that encompasses all things. He is in all things, and all things are in him. So how does this God uh, rule over people? How does he guide them and rule them? As he uses a king to do it. Because we need a king. We need somebody to, that we can listen to that will tell us what to do. And, you know, we're not in such unity with God that we know everything God wants us to do. So now we have this king that is in such unity with God. This is the idea of King David. He is in such unity. But now the Messiah King, David, will be in complete unity with God. In that what he says is exactly what God would say. So you, there's no question about, well, does he really know what he's talking about? There won't be that question at all. Is that he speaks, might as well be God speaking himself. Okay, so we'll get into more now. Um, <clears throat> what's the next thing I wanted to take a look at? Okay, now let's take a look at Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43, verse 8 to 15. Okay, bring forth the blind people that have eyes, and the deaf that have ears. So they have eyes and ears, but they're blind and they're deaf. Okay. Let all the nations be gathered together, and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified, or let them hear and say, It is truth. You are my witnesses, says the Lord. Now when the King James Version says LORD in all caps, it's the name of God. Um, in the Rabbi's verses it's Hashem, the name, is what that means. It's uh, YHVH, the name of God. Okay. So you are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. So what does that mean? You are my witnesses, and my servant, says the Lord, and my servant. So the servant whom I have chosen, what he says, the Lord says. Okay, so says the Lord and my servant whom I have chosen. He could say, says the Lord through my servant whom I have chosen. Okay, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Who? I am he. Who? I am the servant whom I have chosen. You see? It's all, it's the same like where does God end and where does the servant begin? Where does, it's, it's the same mystery. You see? Before me there was no God formed. Neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. So who's the Savior? Is the Messiah the Savior? Well, yeah, in, in, in many of the prophecies, the Messiah is a Savior. He comes to restore. So God's saying, besides me, there is no Savior. I am the Savior. And I am the servant. Okay? <clears throat> I have declared and have saved. I have showed when there was 
no strange God among you. So Jesus was no strange God. I showed, I declared, that was me. Okay? Therefore, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Yes, before the day was, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have sent to Babylon, and have brought down all their nobles and the Chaldeans, whose cry is in the ships. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Okay? God is your King. Now he's declaring, Isaiah is declaring, because when Isaiah was talking, who was the king? The king was Uzziah or Hezekiah or one of these kings of Judah and Israel had their king. But God is declaring himself the king of Israel. So he's talking about a different Israel because he wasn't the king of that Israel. But he's talking about a future time when he will restore Israel and under a restored, perfected, purified Israel, who is the king? It's God. God is the king. Now, they, they, they talk about David, okay, because in, in, to a Jewish person in the history of Israel, David was the greatest king that Israel ever had. He was the, the peak of the Israelite monarchy. But actually, according to the Bible, God is the greatest king that Israel ever had. Because David is not greater than God, is he? But this David is the seed of David from the flesh of David with the full spirit of God. So it's David, he is David, he is God, and he is the king. That has to be all those three things together for all of this to come to, to be fulfilled. You understand? Okay. Hopefully. Um, now, we'll take another look at another um, interesting part of the Tanakh. Psalm 89. Psalm 89, 18. Okay, so we're at Psalm we're at Psalm eighty nine, starting in verse eighteen. For the Lord is our defense, and the Holy One of Israel is our King. So this is um, a restored Israel because he's not the king of the Israel when Psalms was written. That was David who was the king of Israel. So the Lord is our king. Okay. <laughs> then thou speaks in a vision to the Holy One and said, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. I have found David my servant with my holy oil. I have anointed him with whom my hand shall be established, my arm also shall strengthen him, the enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face, and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, 
and in my name shall his horn be exalted, and I will set his hand also in the sea, and his right hand in the rivers, and he shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. David is his God's firstborn, and David is God's firstborn calling God my father. So what problem do you have with Jesus, the son of David, being the firstborn of God and calling God his father? If, if it's not a fulfillment of this, okay? Or if you think the, the Messiah is a David son that will come in some future time, then he will be the firstborn of God, and he will call God his father. I guess Jesus figured it out before anybody else did, okay? And, okay... Also I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy I will keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also I will make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven, which is forever. If his children forsake my law, so now if from a Christian standpoint, who are his children? Jesus' children. The ones who believe in him. Christians. This is the children of this David. Okay. If his children forsake my law, which a lot of them did, I and walk not in my judgments, which happened, and if they break my statutes, and keep not my commandments, which they did, then I will visit their transgression with the rod, and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness I will not utterly take from them, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness that I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. Shelah. Shelah. I guess that's like, so be it. Uh, let it be established. It's a, that's a, a musical term. Um, now, next one. Let's take a look now. Psalm 2. Remember, we're all thinking about this king. The king. When does God get to be king? Okay. Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage, and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. We don't like their rules. We don't want to listen to them anymore. Okay? He that sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak to them in his wrath and vex them in his displeasure. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. So this is after he set his king upon Zion. The, the nations all band together 
and they don't want to listen to his king anymore. Okay? Sound familiar? It sounds sort of like now <laughs> to me. Okay. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me. So who's talking now? The king, right? The king is talking. The king on Mount Zion. I will declare the decree. He, it's the king that declares the decree. Okay. The Lord has said to me, Thou art my son. This day I have begotten thee. I have begotten thee. You are my son. Ask of me, and I shall give the heathen for thy inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, and thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise, therefore, O you kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are they that put their trust in him, in the king, right? So, you know, this concept is not absent from the Tanakh, okay? Now, um, before we look at the next psalm, we're going to take a look at a couple of uh, things that Jesus said. And because he's sort of... Uh, it, it kind of explains some parts of the next psalm. So if we look at the, um, Luke chapter 13. Luke 13, verse 23 to 30. Then said one unto him, to Jesus, Lord, are there a few that be saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up, and has shut the door, and you begin to stand without, and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he shall answer and say to you, I know you not whence you are. And then you shall begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in your presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know not whence you are. Depart from me, all you work workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God and behold, there are last which shall be first and there are first which shall be last. And, uh, Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that kills the prophets and stones them which are sent to you, how often I would have gathered your children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall not see me henceforth, till you shall say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. So this is when Jesus is entering into Jerusalem to be crucified. And he stopped on the Mount of Olives overlooking the city. And he said that. You shall not see me again 
until you say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. So now let's take a look at Psalm 118. <clears throat> it's not a long song, so we'll just look at the whole thing. Give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say that his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endures forever. Let them now that fear the Lord that his say that his mercy endures forever. I called upon the Lord in distress, and the Lord answered me, and set me in a large place. The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord takes my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. So if he, the Lord helps them that help me, then he will also destroy them that hate me. Because um, Jesus said to love your enemies, but that doesn't mean that Jesus uh, does not hate his enemies. He wants us to love our enemies, but he knows who to love and who to hate where we don't okay um, we can do another video about that but um, yeah yeah we'll see okay the Lord takes um, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes all nations com compass me about, but in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. They compassed me about, yes, they compassed me about, but in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. They compassed me about like bees. They are quenched as the fire of thorns, for in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. Thou hast thrust sore at me that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. Okay, this is like talking about the, the final destruction of the wicked. The Lord is my strength and song and has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted, and the right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but live, and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me sore, but he has given me over, but he has not given me over unto death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, and I will go into them. And I will praise the Lord, this gate of the Lord, into which the righteous shall enter. I will praise thee, for thou hast said, heard me. I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me, and art become my salvation. The stone, okay, this is the, the servant of the Lord saying, God has helped me. He has not left me to death. And he has helped me and become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made we will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now the prosperity. So now he's waiting. He's, he's, he's been saved, Jesus. He's waiting for the prosperity. The prosperity, I think, is the, the, the final uh, bringing in of the kingdom of righteous upon earth. Um, in a physical way, what, you know, the destruction of the enemy. Okay. Blessed is he that
that comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord which has showed the light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. So, you know, if you um, really think about all this, who is the stone the builders rejected that has become the head corner stone? We talked earlier about this, in, uh, that the, the all believers, Jesus is the foundation stone, the corner stone, and the believers are, are built upon him as the church. It's a spiritual church. Okay, and um, uh, this is the day which the Lord has made. Um, the day, that day is prophesied throughout the scriptures. The great day, the great day. It's, it's the day that the, the kingdom of righteousness was established with God as king. That's the day Jesus was resurrected. God became king. Okay. Um, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, which has showed us light. See, so there's, there's like a duality in these. Um, out of the house of the Lord, we have blessed you. Um, Okay, the Christians as a house of the Lord, all believing and built on the foundation, they have blessed him. The Jews also, in the olden times, out of the physical house of the Lord, have blessed him, made him king, um, without really knowing it. Same with the Christians. The Christians don't really know what they're doing either. Like it, when, We're talking about the Christian world. Okay, which is a little bit different than, say, the isolated Christians, the, the, or the Christians that are a part of the spiritual house that we spoke about. There's also the Christian world, all these churches that are in bed with the government and, and doing all these political moves and... and are, are rubbing shoulders with the rich kings and that that's a little bit that's the Christian world where God's kingdom is not of this world so there's a difference there too okay so there's another one about the king and and the blessing and the sacrifice all coming together okay now, um, let's take a look now at the verses that the rabbi um, brought up. We'll take a look at those now, uh, one by one. And um, see what we come up with. So the first verse he, he brought up was uh, Isaiah 11, 1 to 3. So now, now that we've learned all this stuff here, um, let's take a look at what the rabbi was, the verses the rabbi was pointing out. Um, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 to 3 was the first one. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, and the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And it shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, 
neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. So, um, how does this, the, the, the rabbi is saying, okay, if he fears the Lord, then he cannot be the Lord. Um, now, we talked at first about Jesus as coming from God, becoming a man, and living out a life in obedience to God, and then being resurrected after death to be once again uh, exalted to the level of God. So, as a man walking the earth, he humbled himself and obeyed even unto death. So in that way, he feared the Lord. To fear is to revere, to... to um, want to be in obedience to God and not want to be in disobedience. It's a reverence that is a, a that's a fear of the Lord. So Jesus demonstrated the, the, the God in the flesh demonstrated the fear of God. It's not that difficult. It's the same question. Where where does Jesus end and where does God begin? Okay? Well, let's take a let's take a quick look now at um, Jesus answering this same question. Take a look at Luke chapter four. Luke chapter four, sixteen. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as the custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered to him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, and has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, and to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and set at liberty them that were bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say to them, This day this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. And all of them bear witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, You shall surely say to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. And whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy, in thy country. And he said, Verily I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. Well, and what they did was they ended up turning against him um, as if he was committing blasphemy saying that he was the one that this prophecy is talking about. So let's take a look at that prophecy. Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, and he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint to them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And they shall build the old waste places, and they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. 
and strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. So who are strangers? Not Jews. Gentiles, right? This is strangers. And the sons of the alien shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers, but you shall be named the priests of the Lord. And men shall call you the ministers of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. And in their glory you shall boast yourselves. So who are the priests of the Lord? It's the apostles. Okay, the ones who believed. Okay, so there's that. And then uh, what's the next verse he showed? Hosea chapter 3, verse 5. Here we are. Now, Hosea is a pretty complicated prophecy. Very, uh, a lot of symbolism in it. And it's, uh, I did a video about Hosea chapter 1 and 2. And I think it touches a little on chapter 3. Um, the video that I did about that is uh, History of God. I have a playlist called History of God. I haven't worked on it for a little while because I'm getting so deep into the Hebrew scriptures that I felt it best that I study Hebrew. So I'm studying Hebrew now and learning um, Hebrew. And it's taking, could, it's going to take a few years to tell you the truth. Um, but uh, but I don't, I was before I get too like into some of this really deep stuff, it gets lost in the translation. Um, you have to really know the original language to be able to um, sort out some of these prophecies because um, the the translations just don't cut it when it comes to that. Um, anyway, um, but in this particular um, instance, he's not really getting into the context of the translation. He's just trying a little trick on you. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, the, uh, the video that I made is in the History of God um, playlist, which is on my channel. And it's um, episode 17, which is a it's a seven um, video episode talking about Ephraim and Manasseh. And in that uh, episode, number six out of seven is called the Day of Jezreel. And that goes pretty in depth into the first few chapters of Hosea. But what uh, the rabbi quoted was. Uh, Hosea chapter 3 verse 5 which says afterward shall the ch children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days so he says uh, the rabbi says it says right here they shall seek the Lord their God and David their king so they must be two different people and that is, um, for anyone who understands Hebrew, that is kind of a ridiculous thing to say. Because in the Hebrew, the word and is almost used in almost every word. It, it's like an English teacher's nightmare. It's um, the conjunction, the, the, the va conjunction is uh, and is and that. And this and that. It's just the way the Hebrew language works. And sometimes it means and, and sometimes it doesn't mean and. It ju it's just uh, carrying the narrative. Um, so to say that in the Hebrew language, that you can discern between whether and means the same thing or two different things, it's just baffling that somebody who knows Hebrew would say that because 
it's only the context that would be able to tell you whether he's talking about two different people or the same person. When you think about it, okay, uh, the Lord their God and David their king. So does it mean that the Lord their God is David their king? Is it the same person? Or does it mean the Lord their God and another person, David their king? It could be either one. In the Hebrew, it could easily be either one. Um, so it's only in the context when you're really going to understand whether they could be the same person or whether they absolutely have to be different people. Um, and then the same concept that God is speaking through the king in that God is the king. I mean, where does David end and where does God begin? You know, where does the king end and where does God begin? That's when the, when the king is entirely 100% in sync with God and speaking the words of God, where does God end? You see? Is it God? Is he God? No, he's not God. He's just exactly saying exactly what God would say and exactly doing exactly what God would do, but he's not God. You see, it's it's sort of it's it's a real theological conundrum when you start to get into that discussion. Um, now so that's, uh, and then the final verse that he quoted is Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 9. Take a look at that one. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up to them. It's the same thing. He's using the word and, um, which is a mystery. It's just a ridiculous thing to say about Hebrew, especially. Um, now, we've already looked at a lot of verses that um, show that God is restoring not only Israel to a purity in serving God, but he's restoring the kingship to himself. Because that is the perfect restoration because they made a mistake in asking for a king. God was their king. So the only way to fix that would be for God to be their king. And he's doing it through the seed of David. God raised up a king. So the flesh he raised up was born and raised up into a man. That's the flesh, the, the man. But the person of that man is God. You see? So he's in the flesh. He's in heaven, sitting on the throne in the flesh. And he is God. And, now, and he's still in all things. And all things are in him. But he also is an actual person sitting on a throne as king. So that we can actually see him and converse with him and relate to him as one of us, because he is one of us. He's a man. He's God in the flesh. But to understand who he is, who this person actually is, then you have to con conceive or um, contemplate the mystery of who God actually is. That's this guy. That's who this guy is. You see? So that's the majesty of God. But it doesn't mean that he can't come as a man and talk to you. He, can, he could absolutely do that. He could appear to you whether you would know it or not. And... and um, he could do that. So, and there's many examples that I've already shown where he has done that. So there's, 
It's not inconceivable to think that Jesus is God. And, and it's even more conceivable when you start looking at these scriptures we were looking at. That yeah, it is God. And he is the king. Okay. And uh, and that concludes our video for today. Uh, it was quite a long one, I think, but uh, hopefully it was enjoyable to you. If you're obviously interested in these things, then it probably was as as it was for me too. So I'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Oh, oh, and I have to say it. Don't forget to like or rumble or bumble or whatever you got to do to help the video move along in the, in the algorithms. Um, I, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you.